we are in a new series today. <clears throat> we are roughly, over the next 15 weeks, going to be going through a book called 15 New Testament Words of Life, Dr. Nijay Gupta. Uh, he has 15 words that he has pulled out from his studies, out of the New Testament in particular, that he reckons <clears throat> uh, we often get wrong or we misapply or we use them differently in 2023 in the West to how they did in the first century um, when Jesus walked and in the early church days. Or we don't use these words at all, some of these words. We just don't use them in the common vernacular as we would you know, just converse, but most of them were used regularly and in general conversation in the first century. Uh, we'll also be pulling from um, J.R. Packer's 18 words, Elliot Grudem's Christian Beliefs, which is 20 Christian Basics. Uh, so you get the idea of these 15 foundational truths, really, words that, that are used in the New Testament uh, to help us both understand <clears throat> the foundation of our faith, to help us understand how are we to walk in the world today in light of the gospel of Jesus, but then also so that as we approach Scripture, as we approach the Bible, that we would actually read out of the Bible what the authors, in partnership with the Holy Spirit, uh, the ultimate author, was actually trying to tell the original readers and what it actually means for us, so that we don't come to a word that we don't use in 2023 in Australia and go, well, I guess I've heard it used like this, and that's what it must mean, and we read our understanding into Scripture and then get an incorrect or <clears throat> unnuanced or uh, just kind of wobbly understanding of what it means, but rather we would say, oh, let's understand that word so that we can read it in its context to its original readers from the original author and then apply it in our lives today. How does that sound? So we're doing a little bit of work. It is... I work in theology, but that's what we do every week. We just don't kind of call it like that. Uh, it will be helpful for you if you, if, even if you're not a Christian, to understand what a Christian's belief. If you're a brand new Christian, to be understand and grow in the confidence and, and uh, understanding of what it is that we believe and the truths of how the world works. Uh, but if you've been a Christian for a very long time, decades and decades, this will hopefully be incredibly helpful, very refining, uh, a good checkup, <clears throat> but also help you read the scriptures, hopefully, that you're very familiar with and perhaps have become too familiar with where you can gloss straight over the words. So what we're going to do over the next couple of months is revisit these words, not in, a, not in supreme depth. Uh, it's more of kind of a, a, a kind of, you know, scratching the surface a little bit, peeling back a couple of layers to help us understand so that as we go to scripture and so that in your own reading and own study and own meditation, uh, you have a richer, deeper more mature um, relationship with Jesus. How does that sound? Okay, awesome. Well, let me pray, and then we will get stuck into the first word. Father God, I want to thank you for your scriptures. Thank you that you speak to us today through your scriptures and by a spirit. And so we're here, we're, we're here to hear from you today. Um, like always, but in particular over these next uh, few months, um, we don't want to read our own understanding into your, into your scriptures, but we want to know what it is that you have to say. We want to know you as you are, what that means for us and for our, our life in the world. And so please help us. Uh, thank you for Dr. Nijay and for the work that he's done. Um, please, Father, would it be a blessing to us, helpful for us as a community. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, today's word is righteousness. Righteousness. We don't really use the word righteous a lot, just in the kind of common everyday. Uh, I remember, so I was a child of the 80s growing up where we kind of had a bit of a heyday where something could be righteous. Oh, that's totally righteous. Died off real fast. These days, usually the only time you would hear the word righteous outside of a Christian setting is with the word uh, self on the front. Self-righteous. Oh, like, guys, so self-righteous. It's really the... I mean, I can't recall really hearing the word righteous outside of that context in a very, very long time, outside of the church, obviously, and outside of our scriptures. Uh, it's usually pejorative or negative. 
even if you even if you are noticing a quality in somebody that is good, <clears throat> you'd usually w- use the word righteous, even if it's not self-righteous. Oh, they're just so too righteous. They're so righteous. They're so otherly. Look at them just levitating as they float around. They're so righteous. Uh, back in Jesus' day, uh, it didn't mean someone uniquely good, someone super special or otherly or, again, like the floating around kind of stuff. Uh, it was a very common word. And so uh, as we look into Scripture today, we're going to see what does righteousness mean or righteous mean? <clears throat> what, does it, what does it mean back then? What does it mean for us and how does it inform how we live? Okay, so Matthew 5, Jesus says very famously, Sermon on the Mount, greatest sermon ever sermoned. He said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are blessed because, he says, they will be filled. So here he's saying, man, if you thirst and hunger for righteousness, you will be filled. And as in the church, so we've looked at this word outside of the church in 2023. In the church, we use this word often, righteous or righteousness, and usually we'll be referring to Jesus, the righteousness of Christ, or that his righteousness is imputed to us or gifted to us or credited to our account. And so we tend to think of righteousness as being something supremely holy, absolutely, again, otherly. But to be righteous is some, something akin to being perfect, And so we want to be like Jesus. We want to live like him. We want to be like him. And so we think, yeah, we we hunger and thirst to be like Jesus, to be righteous. And that that is absolutely a connotation uh, of the word righteousness. But if we look at this word righteous as they used it in Jesus' time, we'll see it was actually a pretty common word that they would use the word righteous in everyday conversation. Not like we do now, but in everyday conversation, they might use this word righteous. Uh, In the Old Testament, one scholar, Wenham, says, it's the most general Hebrew term to describe good people. So if you look at the Old Testament, just a general, almost generic word to describe good people. Not a specifically or specially religious word, uh, although, again, it's become that in our day but a very common word, commonly used to describe someone good. In Jesus' time, also a common word, commonly used in the common vernacular to describe someone good, honest, and trustworthy. So if you're describing a friend of yours as someone who's good and honest and trustworthy, then if you lived in the first century, you might call them righteous. We wouldn't tend to do that in our day. If we knew someone, like a neighbour down the road, Uh, Someone from work who is good and honest and trustworthy, it would be very unusual for us to describe that person as being righteous because, again, it's so often used as a, a, with a negative slant or almost ironically, oh, so righteous. What a righteous person. But in in the first century, when scriptures are written, when Jesus was saying these words, it was more common than we use it today. Good, honest, trustworthy. We don't really have a word like that in English that we use. We kind of would have to bring other words together, like in someone who has integrity, someone who's trustworthy, a person of their word. You might call this person righteous. Uh, Nijay says, To be righteous is to live and behave according to a standard of what is good and right towards the other. And shows uh, in the book that this Old Testament idea of righteous or righteousness included characteristics like being pure of heart, so a clean and clear conscience. Also innocence, so irreproachable, blameless, unable to be accused of wrongdoing, not necessarily perfect, which is kind of how we would think about it these days, absolutely perfect, but someone that you would say, well, they are, you, I can't find fault in them. You might, I mean, you'd hear that in... Uh, you know, Aussies might say that, I can't find fault. 
or to say that they are fair, care about and holding to a just and fair standard for everybody in all things. Oh, they're a very fair-minded person. Again, we'd say that. Or we might say they really care about justice, maintaining a standard of morality for all, offering fair and equal judgment and treatment in all aspects of their lives, no matter what the person, they're not a respecter of persons. I actually heard pretty much all of these things mentioned on Friday about Barry Bromelow, actually. But if someone had got up and said he was a righteous man, to our like, modern ear, we'd be like, oh, that's weird, actually, outside of a specifically religious context. And yet, that's how this word is being used. Well, uh, Walter Bruman, he says, righteousness is an ethical term used to mark people who live generatively. They, they generate in the community in order to sustain and enhance the community's well-being. The righteous person is characteristically one who invests in the community, showing special attentiveness to the poor and needy. So in the Old Testament, an Israelite lived with, a righteous Israelite, lived with integrity and gravitas, who by their presence and their actions lends stability to the community. So God's call to his people in the Old Testament, again, the the grounding for the New Testament is the Old Testament, God's call for his people to be righteous is to reflect him in the world and bring about his rightness in the world. That's the Old Testament understanding and the context for the New Testament. So if we get back to the New Testament, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, the people who would be filled, the people who would be blessed, what does Jesus say about them? A little later in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, don't worry saying what will we eat or what, we, what will we drink or what will we wear for the Gentiles eagerly seek these things and your heavenly Father knows that you need them but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So seek his righteousness and his kingdom first and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So it's, again, God's call for his people to reflect him in the world and bring about his rightness in the world. It means to trust Jesus and his way. That's what it means to live rightly. When the New Testament talks about righteousness, it means to trust Jesus and his way. Seek his righteousness, and these things will be added unto you. Seek his righteousness. Seek his rightness. He's not trying to manufacture our preferred outcome or future by any means other than exampling after Jesus. It means we don't steal. It means we don't seek vengeance. It means we don't go back on our word because all of those things are antithetical to the rightness of Jesus, to his way and his ways. Even though we might it might materially get us ahead. We might be able to get more money or more stuff or more comfort or more ease in our life. Although that's debatable, but we might be able to. Uh, that's not exampling after Jesus or echoing after Jesus. Even when it's costly. Back to Matthew 5. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, because of your right living. Because of your integrity, because of your fairness, because you pursue justice, because you want to live like Jesus and echo him into the world. You're blessed if you are persecuted because of this. For, he says, the kingdom of heaven is yours. Whose is the kingdom of heaven? It's those who, no matter what the cost, live rightly. Even when it's costly, we have a right king, a right kingdom, and we pursue a breaking into the world of this right kingdom and our king through our own right living. This is why where Jesus says a couple of verses later, a couple of verses later, yeah, uh, he says, um, you are the light of the world. And a city set on a hill can't be hidden. A lot of people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. And in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and give glory to your Father in heaven. 
our righteous living, our echoing Jesus, is our good works in the world, which result in God receiving glory. Notice he doesn't say, so that your life will be easy, so that you'll avoid persecution, so that you will have comfort and health and get that job you're going for or live in a big house. He doesn't say any of those things, actually. Our goal is the glory of God in our lives. Paul picks this up later in Romans, uh, in his letter to the Romans, um, chapter 6, says, Thank God that although you used to be slaves of sin, you used to be bonded or bound to sin, missing the mark, you could not hit the mark, you could not be righteous because you were bonded with sin, slaved to sin, impossible to hit the mark. It says, although you used to be like this, you obeyed from the heart the pattern of teaching to which you were handed over and having been set free from sin, you became enslaved to righteousness or bonded to righteousness or, or chained, tethered to righteousness. So say, man, you used to be chained to sin, which means, again, like we looked at last week before, missing the mark, unable to hit God's righteous requirement, but now you're bonded to righteousness. Now you're, I mean, we don't think of being changed to something as being particularly awesome, but, but if, you, if you think about that means, it means that uh, before you couldn't break those chains, and these chains you don't break either. You're a slave to righteousness. You were in bondage to missing the mark. Now you are bonded to hitting the mark. It's reflecting the righteousness of Christ because you have been gifted the righteousness of Christ. Or imputed is the word we often say. You've been, Christ's righteousness has been imputed to his rightness. His perfectly living rightly has been credited to your account. And so now we are bonded to Jesus and his righteousness and we can go and live rightly. Righteousness is about doing, it's about living rightly, but it's founded and it's based in our righteousness in Christ, our rightness, our being right in Christ. And so it's acting in accordance with who you are in Christ. It's acting in congruence with you being a new creation. It's acting in step with the Holy Spirit that indwells you. That's right living, not self-righteousness, not pulling myself up by my bootstraps, not working, climbing my way up the moral threshold, not doing it all in my own power and will, not me being a good person, but founded in my being right with God. So righteousness is being right with God in Jesus, and then it leads to righteousness externally or outwardly, which is upright. In t- oh, sorry, firstly, uh, it's this vertical. Uh, secondly, it's internal, so uh, an internal upright living of honesty and integrity, so that we will, no matter the cost, echo Jesus into the world. And then thirdly, it is about our relationship with others. So modelled by God in his perfect union in himself, in the Godhead. It's modelled by God, even way back in the Old Testament, uh, with his relationship with the Israelites, with the people of God, with the Hebrew people, how he treated them. And it's modelled by God in how he treats us. He treats us rightly, always, perfectly. And so, although our righteousness comes from Christ, and it is, there's an internal um, integrity and uh, honesty to it, there's also this external trajectory as well in us living right with others. Not just about keeping rules, but about keeping a right relationship with others. We want to live rightly with people, pursuing relationships that bring God glory in a way that brings God glory. It's a big deal. Includes a right compassion or rightly ordered desires and affections. Includes rightly seeking justice in an unjust world. 
righteousness at the same time. So uh, the, the goal of what we're doing here is to view righteousness. So when we read the word righteous in Scripture, uh, we would have this more robust or fatter understanding of what it means to be made right with God, to live rightly internally, intrinsically, to live rightly as we walk in the world uh, in a way that is very mundane, very ordinary, very boring, you might say, and at the same time uh, in a way that is incredibly spiritual, amazing, exampling after the God who indwells us. That is righteousness. So it's the kind of living God calls us into, kind of living he commands us to do, the kind of living that he promises blessing for, the kind of living he promises being filled. Like if you thirst and hunger for righteousness, if you think about being thirsty or hungry and the, like a visceral desire and need, Jesus says if you have that kind of thirst for righteousness, you will be satisfied. You'll be filled. In union with Christ, having made a new creation in the power of the Holy Spirit, we actually can live righteously. We need to redeem and reclaim that word for us, actually, to use it in a modern vernacular. Because we, because we have separated it from the mundane, we go, well, yes, Jesus is righteous. And because we don't meet his perfect requirements, of course, we can't be righteous. And so if we can't be righteous, why would we have the goal to live right, righteously? But no, what Scripture is telling us is you can be righteous. Actually, you, you've been made righteous already, so go and live rightly. You are righteous. Go and be who you, ha- who you are in Jesus. You can be righteous. And what I'd love to see us doing is actually starting to call this out in each other where we see it. Where, sure, we'd say, uh, you know, good, good person, person of integrity, honesty, uh, faithfulness, etc. But we would start actually bringing this word back into our vernacular, not in a, an ironic or pejorative sense. But we'd say, man, I, I see Christ's righteousness in you. You are, you are a righteous person. You are, what you did was righteous. Not, again, not in the 80s kind of way. Totally righteous. Uh, but in a sincere way. We bring it back so that when we read righteous and, and righteousness in Scripture, uh, we would apply that to ourselves. Having been made right with Christ and then going and pursuing righteousness in our walk. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for making us right in Jesus. Lord, help us to um, redeem and even claim this title or word for ourselves, not because of our own intrinsic self-righteousness, but because of the righteousness we have in Jesus, imputed to us, credited to our account where we don't deserve it or where we're ill-deserving of it, but also as an example for us to follow. So Father, help us to be right, a people who are righteous, who act rightly, act rightly towards one another, act rightly towards people who are outside of your kingdom and family. Even when it's costly and when it's painful, we do these things because it's right, because it brings you glory, because it's the thing to which you've been called, because it's for our good. And Lord, in, in every sense, in every way, please help us to bring you glory with our righteousness. And Father, so that people who see their righteousness and bring you glory might also uh, see your righteousness, see their lack, like we lack, see that you have made up for that lack in Christ. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.